Okay, we are back. Uh, just quick review of kind of where we left last left off. Uh, we went through <coughs> with glucose entering into the, the different cells, remembering that um, glucose will be phosphorylated either by hexokinase in the muscle tissue or by glucokinase in the liver tissue. The purpose of glucose is to be broken down the six carbon glucose is broken down to a three carbon pyruvate through the process of glycolysis. We end up with cr uh, using two ATP, creating four ATP for a net total of two ATP, as well as producing two NADH. That pyruvate is converted to acetyl-CoA through the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. That's going to pop, pop out a CO2 and then it's going to enter the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. We go from outside of the cell to inside of the cytosol and now inside of the mitochondrial matrix, the furthest part inside of the mitochondria. <coughs> so um, that acetyl-CoA will go around this cycle. Um, the cycle starts going to citrate and then we'll continue to break down um, until it gets to oxaloacetate and then we'll continue going around and around and around and around. Um, producing, giving off some CO2 as well as producing um, one GTP or one ATP as well as uh, several NADH and FADH2. Next, now we are going to be talking about the next step which we're going to is is the electron transport chain, also known as Chapter 11, oxidative phosphorylation. So here are our objectives. We're going to describe redox reactions, identify the steps of the TCA cycle liberating electrons, outline mitochondrial electron transport system, showing the major electron carriers. So this is what we we're going to really tell you talking about those major electron carriers. So at this point, we've created the ATP and stuff with everything that we want and we've created NADH and FADH2. These are our hydrogen and our electron carriers. Now electrons are really can be really, really high energy. We're going to use the energy of these electrons to produce our ATP. So we want to know the components of the electron transport chain. Describe the operation and function of the electron transport chain in energy generation. Explain the process of oxidative phosphorylation explain chemiosmotic hypothesis and its role in ATP synthesis. <clears throat> We're going to describe the regulation of oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, so it has to be regulated. We have to know exactly when we want it to occur, when we don't want it to occur, what's going to make it go, what's going to make it stop. Explain the role of uncouplers in thermogenesis and oxygen uptake by mitochondria. We're also going to describe thermogenesis. Um, hopefully you can also see here thermo. Remember thermo is our temperature. Genesis, Genesis is creation or making. So that gives us a little bit of an, an idea of what we're going to head into. Uh, describe the effects of inhibitors of the electron transport chain on oxygen uptake by mitochondria. So if we think about if we inhibit the electron transport chain from happening, the entire electron transport chain is going to be, uh, the, at the very, very end, we're going to use oxygen in the electron transport chain. So if we are inhibiting the electron transport chain, we're not going to need as much much oxygen. If we're enabling it and we're really, really going, 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 we're going to want more oxygen in the mitochondria. Finally, describe the energetics of the electron transport chain. Okay, <clears throat> jumping right in. Oxidative phosphorylation is the final pathway for energy production in aerobic organisms. Remember we talked about this? anaerobic versus aerobic, aerobic meaning with oxygen, anaerobic meaning without oxygen. We talk about glycolysis is the only step in this whole process that can be anaerobic, that's anaerobic, uh, meaning that it does not need oxygen to happen. Uh, everything else is aerobic, meaning that we need oxygen. The Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain need oxygen in order to happen. But there must be oxygen present for those pathways to occur. Okay, Electrons derived from the reducing agents from various pathways are flown through a series of mitochondrial membrane bound electron carriers. So here's a lot of big words. Mitochondrial membrane bound electron carriers. 
So we have the membrane or that layer inside of the mitochondria. And these electron carriers, so these are going to be proteins that are going to help carry the electrons, are bound within the membrane of the mitochondria. And we'll get more into that later. <clears throat> so these mitochondrial membrane bound electron carriers and other components releases protons. Remember when we talk protons, we're talking about hydrogen. Generates a proton gradient. When we talk gradient, gradient means co different concentrations. So if we have a membrane barrier right here, semi-permeable, we have a whole bunch of stuff up here and not as much down here. This is a chemical gradient. This gradient it has possibility to store energy, storing chemical and movement energy. And we'll get into how exactly that works later on. So this is across the inner mitochondrial membrane. When we talk about the inner mitochondrial membrane, remember the mitochondria, we have the outer membrane. Out here is the cytosol. We have an inner membrane. In here is the matrix. We have the space in between the two of them, and we have our outer membrane and our inner membrane. All of this, this electron transport chain is going to be happening right in here on this inner membrane. So the Krebs cycle happens here in the matrix. Glycolysis happens out here, this is the Krebs cycle. And then this is our electron transport chain. Okay, so this goes across the inner mitochondrial membrane, which finally are returned back into the mitochondrial matrix and couples with ATP biosynthesis. So that whole sentence, all that was saying, we're going to have, we have proteins that are bound inside of this membrane. They're you're going to use the high energy from the electrons to bring hydrogen atoms from inside the mitochondrial matrix. I want a different color. They're gonna bring hydrogen out and create a gradient or a high concentration of hydrogen out here. And then that hydrogen is going to go back. Sorry about that, my colors don't want to stick. There we go. Hydrogen will come flowing back in and that movement and that potential energy from that is going to be coupled with our ATP biosynthesis. We're going to make ATP with that movement. Okay, <clears throat> the electron transport chain. Glucose is completely oxidized to CO2 through glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. Remember oxidized, oxidation is loss, loss of electrons. Every single time that it would loop around that citric acid cycle, we get carbon dioxides popping off. So the entire glucose eventually gets broken down. All six of the carbons that were in the original glucose get broken down throughout and get taken off and broken and parted out as carbon dioxide. So glucose oxidation process removes electrons. So we're removing electrons and those electrons are going and remember those are forming our NADH and our FADH two that's where those electrons are going they're going oh out of the what was the glucose molecule to form these two guys now the electron transfer process is connected to ATP formation which again we'll get into glucose oxidation yields electrons okay so complete oxidation of glucose produces carbon dioxide and water so C6H12O6, this is our glucose molecule. I'd recommend making sure that you know what glucose looks like as its uh, chemical formula. You add in there six oxygen, six moles of O2. So one glucose plus six oxygen molecules gives us six carbon dioxides and six H2Os. So biochemically, this oxidation of glucose follows three major pathways. Glycolysis, citric acid cycle, 
and respiratory chain that includes electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation. So the glucose oxidation can be described as two half reactions as follows. One, the carbon atoms of glucose are oxidized. So what this is saying is that we're especially gonna split this reaction up here into two different parts. Because in reality, they're occurring at different places within the body or in different parts of this process, okay? So we have our glucose plus our water gives us six carbon dioxides plus 24 hydrogens plus 24 electrons. Now molecular oxygen is reduced where the electrons are gained or captured to that water, to reform water. So 6O2 plus 24 hydrogens plus those 24 electrons gives us 12H2O. These electrons, these are the electrons that we're going to use. So first, this is the first thing that happens. Our CH2, we get broken down into CO2. So we saw that in the Krebs cycle that it gets broken down into CO2. And we get those hydrogens and we get those electrons and we form that NADH and the FADH2. And then eventually later on that FADH2 and the NADH are going to be broken down and we're going to have again those hydrogens and those electrons available and we add additional, we'll have oxygen available and then oxygen will then form into 12 H2Os. And we'll go through that whole process in a bit, um, a bit later on in this chapter. There is no direct, direct transfer of 12 pairs of oxygen to O2. This is what I was just saying. Rather, it is transferred to NADH plus and FAD. So those dehydrogenases generate 10 NADH and 2 FADH2. So remember what we were talking about earlier with um, from all the way through from glycolysis right here. So from our glycolysis, from one glucose, we get those 2 NADH, we get 2 pyruvate, 2 acetyl CoA, so we get to do two cycles of the citric acid cycle. So we get another, we get 2 NADH, 2 NADH. 2 FADH2 and 2 NADH here. So there's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 NADH and 2 FADH2. Remember, keep in mind we have using 2 ATP here in the priming phase and we are creating 2 ATP down here in the payoff phase of glycolysis. Um, or sorry, we're netting 2 ATP down here. So using 2, creating 4, so a net of 2. And then we also have an ATP or GTP coming off down here as well. Don't forget about those guys. <clears throat> but total we get 10 NADH and 2 FADH2. So we think there's two electrons here. This gives us 20. And then each of these have electrons as well. It gives us 24. Apologies. This gives us... This gives us an additional four for that total of 24 electrons that we saw up here. So NADH is an electron carrier. That's its function. Its job is to literally hold on to the electrons and transport them and bring them to where they need to go. So we're gonna get, get into how NADH does this. And just a quick little reminder, little quiz yourself moment. NADH, think back what B vitamin is related to NADH. If we think way, way back, N is going to be related to niacin, which uh, B vitamin is niacin. If we think about our, our mnemonic, tall, rich nudists played pickleball for centuries. Tall, rich, nudist is our B3 vitamin, is our niacin. Okay, the hydrogen atom has one electron in its outermost orbit. It can be shown as H with that little electron floating around it. And that's because remember H is also, we can call hydrogen, 
We can also refer to it as a proton. Um, a proton is a positively charged, electron is negatively charged. Um, one and one together, they are balanced, and that is happy as, um, as it wants to be. <clears throat> but in this very first shell, so hydrogen, it has its fir the very first valence shell, valence shell for electrons, can hold up to two. So, but typically hydrogen will actually give up its electron and we'd end up with a H plus with no electrons, but I digress. Now, two hydrogen atoms covalently join, join to form hydrogen gas. It can be shown as H2 or HH or H dot dot H or H double dot colon H. Any of these, these are all, these all mean the exact same thing. Just some of them are showing um, the electrons themselves or however you want to, to look at them. So consider ionization of this molecular hydrogen by biochemical means and it can be shown as hydride ion. So this is hydrogen with two electrons, so it becomes negative. And hydrogen ion or H plus where it has lost that electron, which is what I was just talking about up here. Okay, so we can have either of these two forms. Now, NADH contains one positive charge and the hydride ion. Okay, so our hydride ion, so our hydrogen that is actually carrying two electrons, just like that, is what is binding to our NADH plus. And, the, and this one also contains one negative charge. Now when NAD, when NAD plus is reduced, remember oil rig reduction is gaining, gaining of electrons. So when NAD plus is reduced by hydrogen or when it gains electrons by this hydride attaching to it, it produces NADH and H plus. It can be written as this NADH, NAD plus, plus the, remember the hydride and the hydrogen ion are kind of paired up together. The hydride takes both of the electrons, combines with the NAD plus to form NADH, and we're left with a hydrogen ion. And NADH can be shown as a car uh, carrier of a pair of electrons as NADH, just like that. If this is a little bit confusing, take a moment, rewind it, go back through this, and walk through it step by step. Just understand that the hydrogen, so NAD plus has one, has one positive, the hydrogen or the hydride ion that is binding to it Carry, is carrying two high energy electrons. So because it has two electrons, it has a net charge of minus one. It combines with the positive one charged NAD, NAD, sorry, NAD plus, and together they are now a neutral NADH uh, molecule that is holding on to two high energy electrons. Okay. <clears throat> And that's, so this is all talking about what is happening with the formation of NADH in glycolysis and in the Krebs cycle. This is what's happening. This is NADH being formed, okay? FADH, FADH2, FADH2, it happens pretty much the same way. Just rather than having one hydrogen with the two electrons, Let me make sure, let me change my color so it's easier to see. Here we go. F A D H 2. This is what that looks like instead. All right. Which has the two hydrogens binding rather than just one hydrogen. But we still have two 
high energy electrons. Okay, <clears throat> now we're gonna talk about transporting these NADHs. Because remember, in glycolysis, glycolysis is happening outside in the cytosol. When it occurs out in the cytosol, this is gonna be happening, the electron transport chain where we're gonna use the NADH <clears throat> is going to be inside of the mitochondria. So we have to have a way to get those NADHs that were in the cytosol through that outer membrane and available for use inside of the mitochondria. That's what we're going to talk about now. There's two different ways um, that this happens. So NADH formed in the cytosol must enter the mitochondria and be oxidized. Or alternatively, or in other words, it can be said that the electron pair contained within the cytosolic NADH, so the electrons that are stored in the NADH that was pair that was created in the cytosol, can be transported via other cytosolic molecules into the mitochondrial matrix via reformation of mitochondrial NADH followed by its oxidation to release the electron pair to other substrate molecules or electron carriers. So what this is saying is the same NADH that was made in the cytosol is not going to literally be transported across the membrane. Okay, that's not going to happen. What's going to happen is that the electrons stored in that NADH are going to be transported. Those electrons are going to be transported through a, uh, one of two different shuttle methods. And those two shuttle methods, one of them is the malate aspartate shuttle. And this is going to function most actively, in this case, we'll say primarily. So if, we, if you get a question that's asking about where the malate aspartate shuttle is, these are going to be your answers in the liver, the kidney, and the heart mitochondria. So the malate aspartate shuttle happens in the liver, the kidney, and the heart. The glycerophosphate shuttle is going to happen in the skeletal muscle and the brain. Okay, so keep those two things separate. That's what we want to remember. The liver, kidney, and heart is the malate aspartate and the skeletal muscle and the brain are the glycerophosphate shuttle. Keep those ones straight. Okay, so we're gonna start with the malate aspartate shuttle. And if you're listening, where does the malate, what parts of the body does the malate aspartate shuttle um, occur in? There are three of them. Give yourself a sec, remember it. It's going to be the liver, the kidney, and the heart. Good job. Okay, <clears throat> so the major producer of cytosolic or extra mitochondrial NADH, extra, extra meaning outside of the mitochondria, extra mitochondrial outside of the mitochondria, or the cytosolic, just another AKAs for the same thing. NADH is the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase catalyzed reaction in glycolysis. Remember this super long G3P dehydrogenase makes that NADH during glycolysis. In aerobic oxidation, cytosolic NADH Let me see, I think there might be a typo. In aerobic oxidation, um, so remember aerobic meaning that oxygen is present, the NADH cannot be accumulated since the reducing equivalents are constantly transported into the mitochondrial matrix for production of ATP via respiratory chain. So what this is saying is that when we have oxygen, when we have oxygen um, high conditions, our pyruvate 
is constantly going to be transferred and converted to acetyl-CoA in transported into the mitochondrial matrix um, to go into that Krebs cycle. And so we're left with this NADH, this NADH all throughout. And we can't just let it sit there and accumulate. Because if the NADH um, were to accumulate in this cytosol, meaning that we just have a whole bunch of it, that would actually cause glycolysis to stop, um, to stop its process. NADH is one of those regulatory um, or NADH concentration is one thing that helps regulate our glycolysis system. So we need to make sure that we get that NADH cleared out. Um, <clears throat> good thing to note in here that actually um, when we're in anaerobic condition, so we don't have oxygen, once we form pyruvate, so in anaerobic conditions, the NADH that we produced will break down and combine with the pyruvate to form lactic acid. Okay? Just a little side note there. Um, it's a really good thing to know. Wanted to toss that in right there. Okay, jumping back into our aerobic condition, so we do have so we do have oxygen. So cytosolic NADH reduces oxaloacetate. Remember, oxaloacetate is our final um, substrate, our final thing that we make in the citric acid cycle. And oxaloacetate, remember, was used in a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, and so it's actually going to be outside of the cell, inside of the cytosol as well. So the NADH is going to reduce, or it's going to give its electrons. So the NADH is oxidized, meaning that it loses its electrons. And those electrons are passed to the oxaloacetate, which converts it to malate in the cytosol. So this reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme called cytosolic malate dehydrogenase. Cytosolic NADH donates its pair of electrons to oxaloacetate, converting it to malate. Since, membrane, since the membrane is not permeable to oxaloacetate, it cannot be transported into the mitochondria, but malate can. So now malate is the new carrier of this pair of electrons. Let me find, scroll down real quick. There is a picture. So what we just talked about <coughs> is that we have oxaloacetate here in the cytosol. This oxaloacetate gets reduced or gains electrons by the NADH, and which reducing it, giving it those electrons, changes its shape and it becomes malate. So see right here, see this these extra hydrogen, COO minus CH2, C double bond O. This changes that double bond. It goes to two hydrogens, an H and an OH. And that's what changes it to malate. Now malate is actually able to cross over or be shuttled through that outer membrane of the mitochondria. So bloop, it's, it's able to slip right through the membrane of the mitochondria. And then on the other side, which we'll continue to read, uh, so the cytosolic malate is transported into the mitochondria by a malate alpha ketoglutarate transporter. So they kind of trade places. So malate trades places with an alpha ketoglutarate in order to allow it to go in. Now mitochondrial malate, so once it's inside of the mitochondria, now it's mitochondrial malate. It is reoxidized to then go back and form oxaloacetate and then end form NADH. So there's NAD plus here, so it passes off those electrons and gives us NADH and that other hydrogen ion pops off as well. So mitochondrial NAD, NAD plus receives this pair of electrons from malate 
and produces mitochondrial NADH in this reaction. Thus it can be said cytosolic NADH is now transported and is converted to mitochondrial NADH. So our cytosolic NADH becomes mitochondrial NADH thanks to the malate aspartate shuttle. And just another little, this is a repeat information that one molecule of NADH containing one pair of electrons will end up producing about two and a half molecules of ATP in oxidative phosphorylation. So continuing, oxal acetate, so after malate has um, been oxidized and it has reduced the NADA plus, it's oxidized back to oxaloacetate. And then the oxaloacetate is used to form aspartate. So that oxaloacetate is used to form aspartate by transamination reaction using glutamate as the amino group donator. So glutamate, that's here, donates in a, an amino group. And by donating that amino group, it turns into alpha ketoglutarate. And then aspartate is able to go back through the inner mitochondrial membrane. So one thing, correcting one thing that I said a little bit earlier, um, that this is the inner membrane, not the outer membrane of the mitochondria. This is the inner membrane. Uh, let me actually check something real quick. Okay, so I am unsure if this shuttle needs to occur in the outer membrane as well. From what it looks like, it appears that it does not need to happen, that the outer membrane has um, protein-based pores. so the outer membrane has many protein-based pores that are big enough to allow the passage of ions and molecules as large as a small protein. So for now, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I believe um, from that that the NADH is able to pass freely through the outer membrane, outer mitochondrial membrane, and you would need the malate aspartate shuttle and the glycerophosphate shuttle just for the inner membrane, the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay. Uh, don't quote me on that. It's not something that's obviously not covered in the book. So it uh, doesn't appear to be all that important. Um, so my guess is that that's the case with the outer membrane. That piqued my own curiosity. So sorry about the little, the little tangent there, but it's good information to know. Okay. So where were we? right here. So that oxaloacetate uh, forms aspartate by that transamination reaction by the glutamate. Glutamate goes to alpha ketoglutarate to then again be traded across for malate. And the aspartate then gets traded across for glutamate to come back. So you see it's a beautiful kind of like two little circles where the alpha ketoglutarate and the glutamate are switching places and the malate and the aspartate are switching back and forth and back and forth. 
So this whole process, the whole entire reason for it is just getting these elect the electrons that are in the cytosolic NADH into the mitochondria. So now we have NADH and hydrogen ions inside of the mitochondrial matrix. So aspartate is transported to cytosol by the glutamate aspartate transporter. And the aspartate in the cytosol undergoes transamination reaction using cytosolic alpha-ketoglutarate as the alpha-keto group donor and forms oxaloacetate. Awesome, comes full circle. Sweet. And that is why we have it call it the malate aspartate shuttle because the malate is coming across and the aspartate is going back across. Remember, the whole point is to get these through, get those electrons, those two electrons that were here are now on the inside here along with this extra bonus hydrogen ion, which we'll need to help make that proton gradient. So the glycerophosphate shuttle, so remember the malate aspartate shuttle occurs in three specific structures. Take a second to remember what those structures are, pause. It is the liver, the kidneys, Ooh, I forgot, liver, the liver, the kidneys, and the heart. That's it. The glycerophosphate shuttle, where does the glycerophosphate shuttle occur? The skeletal muscle and the brain. So this shuttle, a slightly different process, but the exact same goal. Get the high energy electrons from the cytosolic NADH across that mitochondrial, that inner mitochondrial membrane in order to uh, go on to the next step of the electron transport chain. So this shuttle system transports reducing equivalents or the pair of electrons from the cytosolic NADH to dihydroxyacetone phosphate or DHAP. Cytosolic glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase, an enzyme in the glycolytic pathway, oxidizes and phosphorylates glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate with NADA, NAD, and an inorganic phosphate producing 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate uh, and NADH. So that was that same step we're talking about in glycolysis earlier to form our NADH. Now, cytosolic DHAP reacts with NADH and produces glycerol 3 phosphate. Notice the difference there? Glyceraldehyde versus glycerol. Remember, glycerol. That's what we want to remember here glycerol 3 phosphate or 3 phosphoglycerate. And NAD plus catalyzed by cytosolic glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. Glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase is an NAD plus dependent enzyme in the cytosol. So, this enzyme, the glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase, must have NAD plus um, in order to, to work. Whereas the mitochondrial isozyme form is flavoprotein enzyme linked with FAD slash FADH2. cytosolic dihydroxyacetone phosphate, that DHAP, is reduced to 3-phosphoglycerate and forms NAD+. 3-phosphoglycerate is oxidized by the FAD-linked mitochondrial membrane-bound glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. FAD receives the pair of electrons reduced to form FADH2 then the reducing equivalent uh, equivalence yeah equivalence is just spelled wrong pair of electrons that pair of electrons are delivered to oxidized uh, ubiquinon ubiquinon we will talk about ubiquinon later 
which is a moving molecule in the electron transport chain. Ubiquinon is also known as coenzyme Q. Q is reduced to form reduced ubiqu ubiquinon uh, QH2. QH2 delivers the reducing equivalence to the complex 3 electron transport chain, and about 1.5 molecules of ATP is formed by the system. So a lot of this information in here um, we haven't quite gotten to yet. Ubiquinon and coenzyme Q, it's a protein involved in the electron transport chain whose job is to pass along electrons. But let's take a look at the actual picture of this here. So we're talking about the NADH that is formed inside of the cytosol within the skeletal muscle and within the brain. So it's going to pass along um, the hydrogens and the electrons from that DHAP, the dihydroxyacetone phosphate, it's going to pass them along and passing that creates glycerol 3 phosphate. So if we look at all of this, see how there's one oxygen here and there are our two hydrogens. Let me draw that other bond there. So there are our hydrogens. Now <clears throat> the glycerol 3 phosphate passes the electrons to an FAD, FAD through a protein called a flavoprotein dehydrogenase. And it's going to form FADH2. And then that will go and get into and release electrons directly into the electron transport chain. So this is a little bit different um, than the malate aspartate shuttle. So the malate aspartate shuttle here, we see that it's going through, helping to get the NADH through all the way to the matrix itself, into the matrix. So this NADH gets all the way into the matrix. Whereas here, our FADH2 just gets into the inner mitochondrial membrane that space. Correction, my apologies. <clears throat> the inner, it makes it into the inner mitochondrial membrane directly. It does not pass all the way through to the matrix um, because it goes, um, the electrons will go directly inside when it gets into that membrane. The electron transport chain proteins are located here in the intermitochondrial membrane, so they just get passed directly into the electron transport chain. This one is a little bit more confusing. Um, make sure that you kind of read through this. I'm going to go through it one more time um, just to make sure that it, it's it's really clear. So the NAD, we have the NADH and the hydrogen ion that were formed in the cytosol during glycolysis. And again, this is in the skeletal muscle and in the brain. Now the high energy electrons that are here are going to be passed due to this enzyme, this glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme, and it passes them on to the DHAP, the dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Passing those two hydrogens onto the dihydroxyacetone phosphate it turns into glycerol 3 phosphate. The glycerol 3 phosphate is then going to pass those hydrogens and those high energy electrons off onto an FAD thanks to the flavoprotein dehydrogenase, which is a protein that is in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Proust with FAD. These hydrogens go in, attached to it to produce FADH2. And the FAD, and then those electrons, that pair of electrons, get delivered directly to ubiquinon Q, also known as coenzyme Q, inside of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay, hopefully that. That time around, it was, it was a little bit more clear. 
Now the next step, the electrons are passed to the electron transport chain. You get re-oxidation of NADH and FADH2 occur and the O2 is reduced to, hide, to H2O to water. So the protons are expelled from the mitochondria, so those hydrogens, and free energy stored in the resulting pH gradient synthesizes ATP via oxidative phosphorylation. So the electrons are funneled to universal elect electron acceptors. The electrons are accepted by NAD+, NADP+, and FAD. The electrons are passed. Okay, now we're going to get into the actual electron transport chain. And I think right here what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop this video. <clears throat> um, just so that way I can kind of label this specifically the shuttles. Um, and then we will jump into the actual electron transport chain um, right after this. Okay, so keep studying, working hard, and good luck.